This is, a, uh, this is an image from um, a treatise by Uccello on perspective in um, the 15th century. And uh, it's, it's to say that perspective and the rendering of images from three-dimensional world has been understood very well for a long time. It's a, it's a simple algorithm. Uh, and what I'd like to talk about today is um, the opposite to perspective, which is the, the reconstruction of three-dimensional worlds from images. Uh, and um, this is, a, this is a, a still from the demo that, um, that, that I gave at TED in 2007. Uh, it's work that came about through a collaboration between Microsoft Research and the University of Washington. Originally, this was uh, from, a, from a thesis project by Noah Snavely. It's uh, 500 images of Notre Dame, uh, mined from Flickr. All right, so these, are, these come from many different people. Uh, over the course of years with many different cameras, many different conditions and times of day and so on. And um, what, what we were able to do with that is to reconstruct uh, the three-dimensional structure of the cathedral from the images and also what those orange cones on the ground are, are the reconstructed positions of all of the cameras uh, relative to those. So I'll give you, I'll give you a, very, a very quick sense of how, how that works. Um, this is, um, this is, by the way, a similar point cloud reconstruction. Those things in the sky are cameras. These are a series of photos that were taken of, um, um, of, a, uh, of a museum in Scotland. And um, the, the points that you see are the three-dimensional reconstruction based only on those images. Uh, this is another example. Um, a series of images taken of the Empire State Building and the point cloud reconstruction of, of a fairly large part of downtown Manhattan just from those images. So here's, here's how, how to think about this. The history of going from two-dimensional images back to three dimensions, um, it has a long history. It's called computer vision, and uh, this field began at around the same time as computer graphics in the 1970s. And the relationship of the two problems to each other is that of a forward problem to an inverse problem. So uh, there, are, there are many examples we could draw from, things like, for example, um, printing characters, taking the ASCII representations of characters and generating images of letters is easy. Computers have been able to do that for a very long time. Going from the image back to the text is OCR, is optical character recognition, an inverse problem, much harder. The same with speech, right? Speech synthesizers, we've all heard those you know, since the 70s, the 80s but speech recognition, where you go from the sound back to the text, much harder. And in just the same sense, uh, rendering 2D from 3D, in other words, saying, here's the three-dimensional model, I'm going to propose a camera position now, and I'm going to flatten it, I'm going to render an image from a certain point of view, that's the graphics problem, the forward problem. The computer vision problem, where you back out the three-dimensional structure from the two-dimensional image, is, is very much harder. But uh, it goes back all the way to the 70s as well. The way it works, very, very fast is as such. So first, you, you take uh, all of the images that you're starting from, and you generally need more than one. A single image is um, too ill-determined to, to uniquely specify three-dimensional world. The, the Escher illusions of infinite staircases and so on are sort of illustrations of that. So you take a series of images of something, and you extract features from them. I'll show you what those features look like in a moment. But essentially, they're points in space that you believe correspond between one image and another. And then you match, uh, you find those correspondences, and what this forms is a network or a mesh between all of those images. And then once you have that mesh, you, um, you just solve a very big system of algebraic equations, and, and those give you the three-dimensional structure. The, the points look something like this. Uh, these, are, these boxes represent points. Uh, features in this image. So at each of those, at the center of each of those boxes is something that looks corner-like, something that looks distinctive in the image. So you take this image, you take another image, you match features across this one and the other one, and then you solve your equations and you get the, the kind of three-dimensional models that I, that I just showed for Kelvin Grove, uh, Kelvin Grove um, Chapel and, uh, and the Empire State Building. So using, using those same techniques, uh, in 2008, in August of 2008, we released uh, a service and a program called Photosynth, which if we had a live internet connection and so on here, I'd, I'd, I'd demonstrate for you. It's really fun to see it work live. But what we designed it to do was to allow people to take sets of pictures of the same environment or of the same thing and upload them. And uh, while you're uploading them, your computer is working to do that three-dimensional reconstruction. 
And so what you end up with is both the collection of images and the three-dimensional reconstruction of whatever those images are of. And uh, we, we conceived of this as a sort of um, new medium, if you like. Uh, and it was, it was very successful when, when we released, uh, within the first couple of weeks, we had tons of new synths, we, as we called them. Uh, you know, the, within two weeks, we had dozens of synths of the Trevi Fountain and of um, uh, the Eiffel Tower and of Chichen Itza and of Tulum and of Angkor Wat and of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and so on, the, of, the, um, of the treasury at Petra, Bryce Canyon. Uh, and in the beginning, we, we had actually imagined, um, we, thought about, we thought about this as a way of avoiding some of the rights problems of mining all of the photos on the internet in order to reconstruct the world, because that's really what, you know, what, what, what excited us and what excited a lot of people who saw this work originally. Maybe there's a latent three-dimensional model of the entire world already out there on all of those images on the internet. Um, and uh, of course, being Microsoft, we didn't want to get into too much trouble by, by starting to make derivative works out of images that we didn't have the rights to and all this kind of stuff. We did, when we released Photosynth, take a lot of care to try to promote the use of Creative Commons as, uh, as the way those images are, are, are created and shared. You can, you can select when you, when you upload your photos whether to make them Creative Commons or to, or to keep them copyrighted. But we very much encourage the Creative Commons use because that allows the sorts of remixing uh, that, that, um, that we think is good. Uh, but in any case, the. This, this is an illustration of one of the problems with that original vision of trying to reconstruct the world from photographs that have already been taken. Uh, Tap Prom is one of the outlying temples in the Angkor Wat complex in Cambodia. And this is a graph of all of the images of Tap Prom on one of the major photo sharing sites. Uh, so each bubble represents a picture and every edge, every link represents a connection between two images, meaning two images that share features in common and that, that, are, that are rendering part of the same space. So uh, in a way, when you lay out that graph, it actually shows you something a bit like a map of this environment. And the thing you can see right away is that you know, this top problem is a rather small uh, temple compared with the major complex, the, the main Angkor Wat complex. And there are two big hotspots. And the two hotspots are only linked very, very weakly. So there are just a couple of images out the front and a couple of images out the back that link those two hotspots. One of them is um, this picturesque uh, fig tree growing in the front of the temple, and the other one is this other picturesque spot, which I think was made famous by Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. Uh, and, um, and everybody takes the same damn picture, you know, with a different face. You can actually play a rather lovely movie where the face changes, the face changes, the point of view changes slightly, but everybody takes exactly the same picture. Very few people on the internet have actually walked around the temple and photographed the entire thing systematically. And that's, uh, which is of course an unnatural pattern for, for ordinary vacation photography, but that's really what you want to do if the goal is to take this particular outlying temple in the Angkor Wat complex and, and actually build a three-dimensional reconstruction of it in a computer. Uh, and that's why uh, in the Notre Dame uh, synths that we got in the first two weeks, uh, most of these synths were actually better than anything that could be reconstructed from Flickr alone because the people who made these we're actually shooting them intentionally in order to reconstruct the cathedral as opposed to just taking the, the popular shot uh, again and again with different cameras at different times of day. Uh, this is, this is the, one of the point clouds from one of those, uh, one, a single one of those Notre Dame images. Now, the other thing, so I, I, I'm very conscious of wanting to go quickly, but I'll, I'll, I'll say something that, I'll, I'll raise one other issue which I think is what, what excites me the most about uh, this project, this photosynth project, construed a little bit more broadly. We're talking about this as read-write world these days. Um, in addition to hosting these, these um, services and these capabilities that allow people to take their pictures and connect them uh, initially to themselves and later to each other, we also have been engaged in, a very, in very, very large-scale mapping projects uh, that seek to, to photograph large parts of the Earth's surface from the air. Uh, and uh, this, this particular one, the Global Ortho Project, is, is one that, as far as I know, is the, is the biggest aerial photography project ever undertaken. Uh, and the, the idea is to be able to shoot at, at very high resolution and uniformly throughout the whole US and all of Western Europe uh, at a resolution that, uh, that allows you to see, I mean, if you look at, if you look at uh, you know, things like Google Earth nowadays or Virtual Earth or Bing Maps or whatever, those give you high resolution in cities, but it's really quite non-uniform. This gives you that sort of coverage 
everywhere and using the same kinds of techniques as, as photosynth uses to reconstruct 3D, you get uh, the surface of the Earth rendered as a, as a height field as well. So here, gray represents height. Um, and, and so using those images, you get, you get not only the, the visual representation, but also the topography in, in wonderful detail. And of course, using the topography, you can apply all sorts of algorithms, algorithms we do understand that we wrote ourselves and we'll happily share with you, and um, extract building footprints, get out 3D buildings automatically, and so on. So uh, the, the thing that we are really working toward with Read Write World is the synthesis or the fusion of this systematic coverage of, of the Earth from above using, uh, using that Global Ortho project and other projects like it. Um, some of these are public data sets, some of them are data sets that, that, we, that we've collected or that we're collecting. Uh, others are uh, data sets that people submit. These are very interesting because um, you know, we expected that, that synths would always be taken from the ground. It turns out that, that many synths are actually taken from the air. Uh, which we, we, really, we really didn't expect. This is uh, an entire peninsula in uh, Croatia, in Primosten, uh, synthed at much higher resolution than we, than we have in the, in the map. Um, and in, this guy appears to have taken these shots out of, a, out of a Cessna plane, and he took them at much higher resolution than we're allowed to, actually. Um, so um, it's people who will violate their own privacy, not, not, uh, not Microsoft who will do it in the end. Uh, we've also released uh, uh, panorama applications for phones that, that let you capture entire environments with the phone. Um, I'll, skip, I'll skip this part. Um, but the goal of all of this is to create a, a medium. This is the, the, the rise in the number of panoramas. We just released the panorama application in, in April of this year, and it's, it's, it's been very, very popular so far. People are contributing these panoramas from all over the world. Our goal is to take all of that aerial imagery, our own ground-based imagery like this, the photos that people are sharing in public, making publicly visible, and using these photosynth-like techniques to connect all of those things together into a giant graph, which we think about as the, the read-write world graph, and which we think about as a, as a, as a commons or, or a collective work, in which individual nodes uh, might have different kinds of ownership or rights structures. Some of them may be copyrighted by particular people, some may be owned by particular companies, and so on. But all of those links and connections are collective metadata and can be followed uh, by anybody, contributed to, read, read from, written to by anybody. And we think that, that this particular capability, uh, I mean, it's, it's just the physical world. It's not about people. It's not about revolutions. It's not about social movements. It's just a rendition of the physical world, but a sort of digital mirror of it. We think that this is a, an infrastructural element um, to making um, you know, what, what we've always thought of as being cyberspace actually real instead of just the, the metaphor that it is today. Thanks very much. I'll end there.